I connected to the pristine, especially the pristine nature of West Virginia from what I've read about, because when I was writing my Sarah book, I felt a correlation between West Virginia and where I grew up in Brooklyn Heights, which was not the Brooklyn Heights as it is now. Having grown up with a displaced family who had escaped, I felt like I could superimpose that wanting of a magical home in history into West Virginia and turn it upside down and do that kind of magical imagining, a magical uh, realm creation. There's a long way of expressing how beautifully you don't make it the point like because when you live in an area it's it's your everyday breath it's what you take for granted and I love the way that the sense of place and the people just are um I'm gonna shut up and <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I guess that's in some ways I don't even like kind of think of think about it uh, in in that way, just because, you know, you're surrounded, you're surrounded by it so much. Um, I think that's I, I want to say it's in Gibbon, Edward Gibbons, the decline and fall of uh, the Roman Empire. He talks about Muhammad and how in the Quran, which I don't think is true, there's no mention of the word camel just simply because they were so surrounded Mm. By these, by these, by these things that they didn't even take note of how to describe them uh, within a particular, you know, whole, holy book. So I think I've spent parts of my life like forgetting or like not realizing uh, how strange the place was uh, growing up. Uh, but then, you know, in my writing, I've been able to, I think, kind of connect back to that a little bit, a little bit more uh, of, you know, how how unusual uh my upbringing was i mean my father was born on my grandmother's kitchen table um which feels like sort of 19th century almost um and i think maybe some of it too is the way that we in the west i guess in particular areas of the world uh you know we feel that we're so that we're so modern uh in some ways when probably the ancient greeks felt that they were really modern too uh, at, at one point in time uh, in in history. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I have those types of stories where, I mean, he was delivered by a dentist, I believe, who tried, he had a bunch of babies out in his car and he tried to trade my grandmother, one of his, one of his babies that he had for my dad because he thought he was such a pretty baby. Now, of course, this is my grandma. This is my grandmother telling the telling the story so the story uh is always uh a bit suspect but yeah i was just surrounded um by a world that had just recently sort of passed passed away or passed on but was still part of i mean you can drive through west virginia now and still see what i call like johnny houses like outdoor toilets mm -hmm. um which my grandmother i don't think had indoor plumbing until the mid 70s so even something as simple as that that we think of as being kind of backwards like if you if you know anything about country people like they believe like why do you want to have where you use the bathroom right next to your kitchen right um so that there was this kind of distrust uh of what modernity was basically basically bringing so yeah i mean i guess it's my subject matter but yeah it's 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 strange to think about it as is subject matter because oftentimes I just feel like I'm kind of dictating almost my uh my surroundings if that makes any sense uh maybe this it was something Jean Carlo is am I saying his name Jean Carlo said? yeah I always called him Gian but his the way you were supposed to say his name it was like Gian his mom it like rhymes with Leon like that's the West Virginia way of saying Gian Carlo <laughs> And he he was from West Virginia. Yeah, he was about uh, fifty minutes north of where I'm sitting right now. So in uh, Charleston, I guess South Charleston in particular. I guess if you want to give a why don't we talk place. a little bit about him and uh, how you guys connected? And because uh, it's funny because there are people who this legend has grown around him, and they think he's he was Italian and he was from Italy, and it's it's it's. Um, 
It's funny how these myths grow around. How I met him was um, uh, he had seen a reading that I'd done in Atlanta and mm -hmm. he sent me an email saying that he that I like my voice reminded him of home or something and uh he wanted to publish my book and I like I think I googled him at the time and there was a, there was a picture of him on HTML well first of all I was thinking like I don't, I don't know man it's a weird this weird guy emailing me I'm not I'm not I'm not going to publish with him and then there was a picture that he had posted of him holding I think a Glock in his mouth I believe Mm -hmm. And I saw that picture. I was like, that's the guy for me, right? <laughs> that's, that's funny. Why? Why? <laughs> um, it's it seemed uh outrageous and and ridiculous. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it was, I guess it's a part because there's this thing that he did where he created uh he kind of created a character, and the character was so much different than who he was as a person. I hear a lot of people saying he was so cool and like I felt very different about it like I thought he was very uncool which made which made him uh cool he was a warm person since and so we then just started emailing back and forth and started working on a started working on a book and I mean those were the days too when no one knew who I was no one cared about who I was and uh and we just clicked Gian and I, like most West Virginians, we have like a chip on our shoulder and we're like obsessed with West Virginia. And we always want to like include individuals who are who are not even West Virginians, but we want to claim them as West Virginians. For instance, RZA, you know, from the Wu-Tang Clan, he yeah. spent a, he spent his family lived in Steubenville, Ohio, which is also the hometown of Dean Martin. And it's just across the Ohio River from West Virginia. And so we. I basically claim Rizza as a West Virginian. Honorary, right. Yeah, because he would have been in West Virginia. I'm sure he would have crossed over into the river and he would have got that flavor. He would have got that flavor. I love the, like you, in your, your emotional truth and landscaping, you, I, you startled me by allowing the book scott to be as shitty and fucked up as he needed to be honest in his awful trueness and that to me reading about how you talked about editing you, you said um you, that you rake you know that uh uh, the fine you talk about the final stages of a manuscript and the scathing edits. That book was raked. That, that's my editing process. I start raking away and keep pulling back as much as I can. If you pull things, if you pull back from things as much as you can, those emotions will still be there. And 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 to me, part part of that is allowing that. Um, not prettying things up and not being afraid of what has become, you know, the sensitivity reader, things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, to go back to your original, one of your things that you said about the Cheat River, which I think is also, you know, your imagination, that's, there's, there's all, West Virginia depends a lot on tourism. And a lot of times I think people have this idea that like West Virginians feel so connected to their river, or they feel so connected to their mountains. But my experience was just that, that the, you know, our river was the new river, which is a funny name because it's one of the oldest geological on geological time rivers in the world. And it's called the new river, but we, we didn't participate in the new river's life, right? Because the new liver, the new river would drown people. You know, my mother had, children that she taught in school who had drowned you know we had family members who had drowned and there was this like there was this distrust of your natural uh sort of in, environment it wasn't like feeling connected to the place it was a place of like danger you know the river was dangerous uh in in that sense which we deal with in our tourism culture now of like people wanting to climb mountains and it's like why would you it's almost like a disrespect to the mountain, right? Why would you want to disrespect the, <laughs> disrespect the mountain in that way? So even within what you were saying there about, you know, your imagination, just in creating that story, um, I think that that's, there's some sociological even truth 
um, with within that. And I guess I don't know to connect it back to my revision uh, process with writing. I guess that writing, I've always just felt that it's this is I don't know. This is going to sound strange, but I think writing's just like the uh, kind of compression and releasing of energy at various times throughout uh, the narrative. And if you write that sentence over and over and over and over and over again, you're going to create an energy, I think, inside of that sentence that you're probably not going to get in the same way that if you're typing the sentence out uh, in, in some way like that. I mean, I guess it's the reason why you know, the Old Testament so like, kind of perfect in a way is that it was worked on over millennia you know like i mean it was it was it was worked on by generations of individuals even going back uh into those into those books so my process has been that i want to like charge it i want to like put energy into it so that when someone is reading it hopefully i don't know if i'm lucky enough you know 50 years after i'm dead or whatever that they'll still feel that particular particular energy and there's this thing that, and I mean, it's been around forever, but, you know, the language people, um, you know, books are always translated. So the the writer of the original text become, you know, the original Dostoevsky is a very different Dostoevsky probably in English. But what remains, well, what remains is that kind of magical experience that the author has in constructing that particular book. And I think as writers, sometimes we lose track of that. There's this amazing book that was published last year by a writer, uh, Irene Vallejo. And uh, it was originally published in Spanish and translated. And it's called Papyrus. And it's about the history of papyrus and how books were first put onto papyrus and the way that writing changed when it moved away. Because papyrus doesn't work in Europe where mold can set in. So they have to start killing animals and putting the text on the animal, which also limits the amount of space that you that you have within that uh, within that text, because you can't kill all of these, you know, a, a book in, I don't know, the 12th century or the 11th century was, you know, a wealthy person's object because of the number of animals that went into it. But what I wanted to say, though, about uh, Papyrus is that, you know, she talks about, you know, the early kind of components of language and writing language down. And there is this almost sorcerer-like kind of quality to it in that, you know, on a, uh, you know, syllabic level, you can write down like the Phoenicians or the Greeks, you can write down a word and through magic, someone else who knows these particular images will be able to all of a sudden have a picture of a cow pop into their mind because the word C-O-W has been placed within, within the text. So I look at writing in that way. It's sort of like, you know, it's like a magic trick uh, in, in that way. And you have to believe in this stuff and you have to charge it full of, you know, your spirit. Um, and it is, and it is this, it is this very kind of complicated thing uh, a book, 